words of power because we are kings and our words matter. God has already started showing you power, has already given you power. It happened way back. And until now, he's been showing you power, giving you power. Power is there for you all these days, months, years. It has always been there, whether you knew it or not. Power is there. Please open your eyes. May God open your eyes so that you can see what is there. You understand the point of football. The point of football is very simple. You have to hit a goal. <coughs> what do you have to do? You've got to hit a... If you hit a goal, you can win the match. Right? The person, the team which hits more goals, scores more goals, wins the match. They don't give points for doing all the dribbling and the tackling and the heading and all the... You know, those, they look good, right? Have you seen football players? They can they amazing things they can do with their feet, but they don't give any points for doing that. <laughs> you have to take the ball all the way from here all the way to the goal post, and you have to hit it inside and score. That's the point of the game. Well, but uh, I don't know about you, but I don't like football very much. You know why? Because very rarely do you get to see goals. You watch 90 minutes of the game, and total itself, there's only like three, four goals. If you have four goals, that's a good match, you know. If you have five, six goals, five, six goals, that's a fantastic match. You could even have a match where there are no goals. The whole point of football is to score a goal, but you could have a match without? You could have zero, zero. Everybody is trying to score a goal only. They all know where the goal is. They are all heading towards it. Every time they touch the ball, they're taking it towards the goal only. But there are a lot of hindrances coming against them, stopping them from reaching that and scoring and winning. Life is like that, right? 
Sometimes you know where you want to go, what you should do, you know. You know the goal. You have, how many of you have goals? Right? I'm sure we all have goals in life, right? You know what your goal is. You know where you should go. You know what you should do. But on the way, something is coming against you. In football, the opposite team is coming against you. But in life, you got the devil coming against you. You got sin coming against you. You got the world itself coming against you. You got sometimes your friends and your family itself coming against you. You got a whole lot of entrances. At least in football, they play by the rules, you know. They cannot come and just like kick you from the back and take the ball and go. They'll get a penalty, you know. They'll, 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 give a, they'll get a yellow card or a red card or something like that. But in life, guess what? The devil doesn't play by any rules. <laughs> he comes from behind only. He doesn't come from front. <laughs> And he can do, you know, what I'm trying to say is, if it is score, so hard to score a goal in football, then how much harder is it to accomplish the goals that we have in life? It's not enough to know where the goal is. It's not enough to be going towards the goal. You've got to have some special ability to get past all the hindrances, go all the way there and score the goal. You know what I mean? It's not enough to know where the goal is and to go towards it. You got to have special ability to overcome all the challenges, hindrances, and go and score. In life, it's the same story. Sometimes we know where we should go, what we should do. We know God's will for our life. But uh, hindrances are there. You have to pass all that. You need ability for that, right? Ability. Everybody say ability. I'm going to talk about ability today. Or let me put it like this. I'm going to talk about power. Some of you may be thinking, what is this power? You know, I, why I started with the football example is usually when you say power, people think of some brute force, right? Think of muscle power, you know, like punching power, like a boxer's power or a sumo wrestler's power. But power is much more than that. Power, let me tell you what power is. Power is ability, okay? Power is ability to do a particular thing. Or let me put it like this. Power is ability to reach your Goal, power is ability to do something great or difficult, okay? So in football, power is not brute force. You cannot take a boxer and tell him, go and play football. He's a, he'll be a useless football player. You cannot take a sumo wrestler and say, go, let's see, you know, you have a lot of power, go score, eh? No, no, for football, you need a different kind of power. You know, Messi, they say he's the best player in football. He doesn't have brute force, you know, he, it's not that he has force, he can whack the ball as, you know, harder than anybody else. No, no, he has skill. He has a skill where he can, I'm talking about the best player today, right? He can get past every player more than anybody else. He has the ability to go around them, go, you know, through them, go under them, all these gimmicks he will do, get past them. And then when he goes near the goal, the goalkeeper is there. And if you hit it straight at him, he will catch it. So he, Messi, I'm talking about Messi, Messi has the skill to Put the ball in the corner of the goalpost, just, just inside the corner where the goalkeeper can never touch it, but it goes inside. What I'm saying is, power is much more than brute force. There are different kinds of power. Power is ability. That's why I defined power as ability. It's all kinds of ability. You can have muscle power, which is the ability to do things with your muscles or physical strength. You can have money power, which is the ability to do things with your Money, right? Reach your goals with money. You know, a lot of people, a lot of parents have the goal of educating their children, giving the children the best education, right? Sending them to the best college. I'm sure every parent wants the best for their children. But is every parent able to achieve their desired goal? I say to you, no. Some of the parents lack money power. They want to send them to the best college, but they cannot send them there because the fees is too Hi. So you can have muscle power, you can have money power, you can have manpower. You're sitting here, thousands of people are sitting here, thousands of chairs have been put here. I cannot call Mike Tyson a boxer to come and put chairs, even though he has power. I cannot call Lionel Messi, who has power in football, to come and put chairs. No, no. I cannot call the richest person here. That he will be money power, muscle power, you know, all those powers are useless to put chairs. If you want to put thousands of chairs quickly, you need what? Manpower. <laughs> you need a lot of people. The fellows may be weak, 
But if you put together 20 people, that's enough to put the... See, what I'm saying is power is ability and it's different kinds of ability. It's all kinds of ability. Power is a broad word. Don't think of power in a narrow way. Think of it in a broad way. I'm talking about power. God has goals for us, right? God has a will for us, a purpose for us. He wants us to go somewhere, do something. And how many of you know God's goals for us are very great, right? They're higher than our goals, right? His purposes are higher than, his ways are higher than our ways. That means if you want to accomplish God's purposes in your life, if you want to go where God wants you to go, be the person God wants you to be. If you want to become a better father tomorrow, one year from now, if you want to become a better, how many of you want to become a better father, a better, better mother, a better husband, a better wife, you should have that kind of goal. See, you cannot be like this itself today. As you are today, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. No, <laughs> only Jesus can say that. Every one of us has to keep improving. See, we have to have goals in every area of life, right? We have to have goals in our personal relationship with God. If you are, you know, your fellowship with God, it should improve. One year from now, it should be better, right? We sang, sing the song, every day with you is sweeter than the... It's supposed to be sweeter. No use just singing it. It really is meant to be <laughs> sweeter, you see? If you're experiencing victory over sin, the level of victory you experience over sin has to be greater one year from Today, you have, we have to grow as a believer. You know, sometimes uh, in in, when it comes to victory over sin, I think what I've heard many people say is this, that is your experience and my, my experience. The fact is, I think the truth is, we experience victory a lot of time, right, over sin. When temptation comes, we are able to overcome it. But sometimes we fall. And if you notice when we fall, we usually fall to the same thing. Again and again. Maybe some people will fall to one particular sin. Another person will fall to another. Maybe some people have the weakness of, you know, I don't want to name specific sins, you know. But you imagine yourself, you know, you know what your weakness is. If you think about your life and your life of victory over sin, you will find, I think, most of, uh, this is true in most cases, that you, when you fall, you fall mostly to the same temptations, because you have a particular weakness. All of us, you know, we have particular weaknesses. And the devil attacks that particular weakness, right? And we fall. When we fall, it's to that particular temptation. What I'm trying to say is, power. Do you have the power to overcome everything in life, every hindrance to go past, every hindrance and to defeat every enemy? Is it possible to overcome that one temptation, right? That one thing that you keep falling to again and again, is it possible to go past that? Do you have the power to do that? You need a lot of power, you see. It's not enough to have muscle power, money power, manpower, memory power. It's not enough to overcome sin. You need a different kind of power. I'm today talking about the power that you need to achieve your goals in life, your God-given goals in life, if you want to achieve God-given goals, you need God-given power, right? Man's power is not enough. Man's power is enough to develop some skill in football, but man's power is not enough to develop some skill in living a victorious Christian life, you see. For that, you need the power of God. In order to accomplish the will of God for your life, you need the power of God to do that. Go past every enemy, go past every hindrance, every attack of the devil, every temptation of sin, everything that comes and distracts you from accomplishing, fulfilling your goal. You need a lot of power. You need God's power. I'm sure you know that. How many of you say, I need God's power to live this life successfully, victoriously. My power is not enough. I need God's power. Now, almost every Christian knows that, right? Every believer knows that we need God's power. That is why what do we do? We pray, God, give us power, right? God, give us wisdom, give us power, give us ability, right? Because we know we need his power, and so we pray like that. Even Paul prays, I want to take you there. This is our main passage. I said we're talking about power, right? Ephesians 1.19. And what is the 
exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. Actually, you know, it's not obvious that Paul is praying here. But in the context, if you see Paul is praying, okay. Uh, if you, the, the prayer starts in uh, verse 16, okay. I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer. So he's praying for the Ephesian believers. And then he tells us in what he's praying for in verse 17. I want you to notice, I want you to see that Paul does not say, God, give us power. God, empower us. God, give us the ability needed to do this task. God, I need your power. My power is not enough. Please give us power. Paul does not pray like that. I want you to see that. Verse 17 onwards. What is Paul praying for? 17. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of. So he's praying that God will give wisdom and revelation. The key word there is revelation. Okay. Revelation. And then verse 18. He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So he's praying that the eyes of the understanding must be enlightened. So that you may know. Know what? Know three things. What is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints? What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? He's saying, God, give them wisdom. Give them revelation. Open their eyes. Enlighten their eyes. So that they may know what is the hope they have. What are the riches they have. What is the power they have. Okay? That's the context. Let's look at that. He does not say, God, give us power. He says, God, give us revelation. Enlighten our eyes to see the power we already have. Right? Isn't that what he's saying? Look at that. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. What does that mean? He's saying, God, turn on the light. Right? Turn on the light so that they can see, so that these believers can see the power that they already it's like this, you know, you go, may, may imagine a room, right, which is full of things from bottom to top, from this corner to that corner. It's filled with things. But if the room is pitch dark, can you see anything? Right? You can't see anything, right? That the room may be full of things, but if the room is pitch dark, you can't see a thing. You'll think, if you see the room and it's dark like that, pitch dark, you'll think there is nothing in the room. The room is empty, right? That's the kind of thinking Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, oh God, believers think they don't have power. And so they are saying, give us power, give us power. Oh God, let them see that you have already given them power. Turn on the light so that they can see the power that's in, the, in their life. Okay? That's what he's saying. Who must turn on the light? God must. God must. Notice that. God must turn on the light. And therefore, you have to pray for that. You cannot turn on the light. God has to. God has to show you. God has to reveal to you. God has to give you revelation. And you have to pray for that. And Paul is praying for that. And he's saying, let them see the power that they already have. How do, I, how do we know that we already have power? Look in verse 19. How do we know that we already have power? Already have ability. Already have everything we need to reach our goals. How do we know that? Verse 19. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? Let's take that. Okay. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? Who believe toward us who believe? Us who believe means what? Believers. He's talking about believers. He's saying what is the... I want the believers, God, I want the believers to know what is the exceeding greatness of his power that is shown toward us. Uh, it is made to clarify the point here, right? It says here that God, the meaning is God is showing us power, right? What is, notice the English word is, right? God is, Paul is not saying there is no power, God give us power. He's saying, oh God, let the believers see what is there. Are you able to see that? Right? What is, they, they may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power, right? Is his present tense, right? Is. If you walked into this room, if I asked you, is the light on? You'll say the light is on, right? You'll use the word is, right? The light is on. What does that mean? It's on right now. When was it turned on? It was turned on at 
5 o'clock in the morning and it's been on all this time. Okay? So from then to now it's been on. That is the meaning Paul is using. He's saying God has already started showing you power, has already given you power. It happened way back and until now he's been showing you power, giving you power. Power is there for you all these days, months, years. It has always been there whether you knew it or not. Power is there. Please open your eyes. May God open your eyes so that you can see what is there. See what is in the room, my friend. See what is <laughs> the power of observation. Right? You know, not everybody has the power of, I'm talking about in a worldly sense. Some people can walk into a room and uh, they can notice everything. Have you seen such people? You know, some people are sitting around you. They know what, they've seen what you're wearing, your earring, your sari, your shirt. Your shoes, everything, they've noticed it. There are people with that have a power of observation is very acute, very sharp. Such people you can send to be detectives, you know, to a crime scene. You know, because they'll pick up all the little details. You can't be a detective and have poor power of, you can't, you know, go to the crime scene and not see everything that is, you know, oh, uh, did you, you know, <laughs> you have to be able to observe every little thing. Paul is saying, you need the power of observation, spiritual observation, right? Spiritual, you need a power to see what God has given you spiritually. That's what he's saying. It's not that it's not there, you just can't see it. <laughs> You're just, for some reason you've missed it, right? How many of you know, you've gone to a place a hundred times, sometimes you miss seeing something. And then finally you see something and you think, how come I've never noticed it? It's like that, right? God's power is already there. Everybody say it's already there. Paul is praying that we may know, that we may be able to see what is already there. It's a power that is ready to use. It is there, ready to use. In the English, you see, uh, it says toward us, right? What is the exceeding greatness of his power? Toward us. Now some people look at this word toward and then they say God has turned his power toward us. So it's like a light which is shining from there. But uh, the power doesn't come and fully reach us. It's only turned <laughs> toward us but it doesn't come and now that's nonsense really. You have a fan. Imagine a fan. It's blowing air. It's turned away from you. If you turn it towards you, does the air reach you? Yes. The air reaches you. You benefit from it. You can use that power, right? That chillness, that, that thing benefits you. What I'm saying is turning toward means, doesn't mean God is turning toward us, you know, showing his power toward us, but it never reaches. No, no, it does reach us. What he's showing to us, the real meaning is to us, you see. In fact, some translations will even say in us. The power, what is the exceeding greatness of his power? In us is even there. See, what I'm trying to say is, this is a power that God has made available for you. It is there for you. It is ready to use. Everybody say ready power. Ready power. Not ever ready battery, you know. Ready power, right? In fact, it's already there, right? It's, uh, you may say, how can you say we already have power, you know? Uh, if we look, if my, my life experience doesn't seem to match that, right? If I look at my, sometimes when you look at our life, it doesn't seem like we have power, right? It seems like we lack power and that's why we pray. But Paul is saying you already have power. But you know everything in the Christian life is like that, right? The Bible says you already have healing, right? By his stripes you were. It says you already have it, right? Same thing, prosperity. You already have, you all know this, right? You've been taught. Well, you know, you already have it. You simply have to take it by faith. Everything in the Christian life is like that. God has already. What do we mean by saying you already have it? We mean to say God has done everything he can to make it available to. That's all. God's part is over. <laughs> so now to say God give us power, give us power is meaningless. Right? He's already saying, I've already given it to you. What do you mean give us power? It's there. See what's there. Pray differently saying, God, open my eyes to see what's. See, that's what Paul is saying, right? It's like this, you know, it's like a bank account. You all have bank accounts, I'm sure. You know. In the bank account, 
if the money is already there, you won't be afraid or disturbed or worried, right? Imagine in the bank account, you have a lot of money, but uh, you are going to the shop and in your pocket, you don't have money. Will you be worried? Oh, yo, I don't have any money. Oh, yo, you know, what to do? Will you have that kind? No. What will you say? You'll say, well, I don't have money right now with me, but I have it in my account. I'll just go to the ATM, withdraw it, or do something. You know, you see, what I'm trying to say is, when you believe that God has already given it, it's already there in your account, that gives you a new level of confidence to believe, to confess, to live, right? Living with the belief that it's already there, is a higher level of living than living with the belief that, oh, it's coming. I've asked God, and God has said he will put it in the account. So I'm going to check whether it has come, it has come. Has it come? Has it come? You know, you know what I mean? Everybody say it's already there. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there. Cross.